decrepit folks who are willing to come indoors on a lovely June afternoon and in San Francisco, as many of us had to do for innumerable parade committee meetings. Uh, oh boy, didn't they find it <laughs> Years ago. You want us to come up one more? Um, <laughs> so the very same reason that we're doing the panel, the fact, the point is one of the most important people here is the camera. Because this is getting recorded as a form of collective oral history of what things were like. So um, let me do a brief introductions, and then I'll give sort of an opening statement. And then I've got questions I'm going to be peppering people with. Okay. And if you have questions or comments or what? No, it wasn't like that at all. I hope you'll just chime in. Um, I'm, I'll start. I'm Randy Alfred. I'm moderating the panel. Um, and I was involved in the 75, 76, 77, and 78 parades in various uh, forms. Mm -hmm. Howard Wallace, a longtime labor and queer activist in San Francisco, um, was one of the, the leaders of the Bay Area Gay Liberation uh, opening up the parade committee in 1975. And he'll be talking about that a lot more. And he's done so much that we could spend the entire two hours just talking about Howard's accomplishments if we wanted to. But uh, why Howard is on the panel is what I'm telling you. Celeste Nubro was the chair of co-chair of the 1978 committee, which was the year of Briggs and the year of various uh, other things, various organizational battles. The year of Briggs, the year of the rainbow flag. Paul Gabriel, um, who has been associated with the History Society for a long time and is the uh, curator or curatorial advisor for our something, co-curator co of the current Dykes on Bikes exhibit, which if you look around you, you will see his monument. Um, Paul did, did interviews with Bill Beardemple, one of the key organizers of the generation just before Howard and myself and Celeste, uh, a parade organizer, and with a number of other uh, lesbian and gay activists of, of the era of, of the 60s, late 60s and early 70s. And what um, I'm just add to, I also interviewed Jerry Allender, who helped found Gay Liberation Front out here, and was a key organizer for the first gay end in Golden Gate Park in 1970. First year after Stonewall. 1970? 1970. He must have been a teenager. <laughs> and, and who's the fellow who wrote the uh, homosexual, uh, who was a major position paper that we've seen a lot of? He's also on uh, I can the always remember his name. I'll remember it later, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. It's in Carla J. and Alan Young's book. Yeah. Carla Young and Alan J. So. Okay, Carl J. and Ellen. Got around the country. Okay, so um, the 1974 Gay Freedom Day Parade, and that's what it's called, was my first. I could have gone in 1973, but the only person I knew who was going was a boyfriend I'd just broken up with. <laughs> and I was having a bad self esteem week. But in 74, there were 3,000 people. I thought, this is great, except where was everybody else? It was very bar-oriented, very tenderloiny, and it had about 3,000 people in it, and there must have been at least 50 lesbians of the 3,000 people. It was that small a turnout, and it was that male-identified. Um, the 75 parade had 10,000 people, of which 1,000 were lesbians, approximately. And there were 60,000 people watching. So that's still not parody, <coughs> but it's more, a lot more than 50. <laughs> and, and the, the 76 parade was about the same size, 15,000. I mean, it was much larger. We were very happy. Like, oh, 15,000, 50% growth. Little did we know 
1977 was the year of Anita Bryant, the Orange Juice Boycott, the marches down Market Street, Harvey Milk's candidacy was going on at the same time, although we didn't know quite how historic it was. And there were 100,000 people in the parade. There were another 100,000 people watching it. And there were about 100 to 125,000 people at the festival afterwards. Was it a fluke? Was it a one-time thing? 1978 was the year of John Briggs, the Briggs Initiative, which would have banned anyone, any lesbians, gays, bi's, people with errant thoughts, for all we know, from teaching in any school in California. Um, and it turned out that under the leadership and tutelage of Celeste Nubro and, and her committee, we had another 100,000 or maybe 100,000 plus parade. And in fact, since then, the size of the parades, you know, you, some years maybe it's a little bit less than, sometimes a little bit more than, but it moved to a new order of magnitude. And it's essentially been there, like found its level where it stayed for about 30 years. I'm not sure how you could fit more than 100,000 people in a parade going down Market Street. Anyway, the long ones have taken five and a half or six hours to get from one end to the other. So the question is, how did that happen, and, and so forth. So I'm going to start by asking, I'll, I'll ask Celeste first, when was your first parade, okay. and when was your first parade committee meeting? Okay. Well, I, I have taken copious notes to respond to your questions, and um, 1977 was my first parade, and um, I think really that was the year when women came out on Moss. Um, in, in, in my own situation, um, I had not in any way been a gay activist. Um, I had been a feminist activist. And kind of in the late 70s, there were two different kinds of lesbian activists. There were the gay activists and there were lesbian feminists. To me, the, an archetypal gay activist was Judy Gron. You know, she was very gay identified. And uh, I was very woman identified. Um, I, I, I could, you know, quote unquote, some of my best friends were gay men, but that was sort of where it ended. You know, I didn't have a sense of my identity as a gay person that was in any way equal to the oppression I felt as a woman. And um, so I came in because, very specifically, I wanted to infuse that parade with the energy of women. Uh, my sense of it, my impression of it, was that there were a lot of women, maybe a third, uh, but that it still was male-led. And, I mean, that was my impression. It may not have been, you know. It might have been run by some dominatrix, for all I know, but I, I didn't know I was in the audience. It's an interesting and fantasy <laughs> for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was, um, you know, does that respond to your question? Or? Sure. Why, so that was the 77 parade. Right. A year yeah. later, you well, went to a you committee. Want, you want me to just go ahead and do, the, do well, my presentation or, or what? Do you, do you have you a little know? presentation? Yeah, I have no, a little no, presentation. No, 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 Let's no, go. Okay. Um, you know, I, mean, I thought your questions were just exceptional. You know, I hardly get to spend any time getting organized. Um, I came in as a lesbian feminist, and actually, during those three years, I actually learned the commonality that I had with gay people. I, I had not had that sense before, and I can talk about that maybe a little bit more, but the late afternoon of 1977, I attended a Wiccan ceremony at Golden Gate Park that was um, led by a woman named Batia Podos. Know about him. And she was she was a feminist witch of just great magnitude, and in in all any kind of way you want to <laughs> look at it. And uh, I was so impressed with her performance and with the ritual that I made up my mind that I wanted her to give the invocation in 1978. And that was my primary motivation for getting involved in the prayer committee. I wanted Bonnie Photos to give the invocation. 
And she and she did. So that's mainly a, that's spiritual. Which is already a place. Yeah. No, this is interesting because yeah. we're already in a place where I'm learning something new for people well, it was that I know. But, but it was political spiritual to me. Okay. You know, feminist feminist spirituality is political, just like in many ways Jewish spirituality is political. It's a political religion, and so uh, and I'm I'm not a religious person at all, but I am a political person, and uh, so um, you know. <laughs> Thing, put it there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, I got involved with the parade, and it was just it was an incredible experience. My first meetings that I went to in '77 were not parade meetings; they were the organizing meetings of what became the Coalition for Human Rights, and it was just explosive. I don't know if you were there at that time, but yeah, took off. Yeah, yeah. took off. Sometime in early spring, um, or mid-spring, and I was being like a poet in a garret, I um, had this habit of, when I was writing, I had the television on without sound, and then classical music. Samuel Coleridge would put his feet in ice water, and the way I wrote was when I had the TV on without sound and classical music. And so I was looking, I happened to look up at the screen, and I saw this woman's face. And it was like just right in her face. I mean, it was like she was feeling the screen. Um, she looked very sad to me. She looked like she was getting ready to break down and cry, and she looked very frustrated and just a very unhappy person. So I thought, well, you know, maybe this is an aspirin commercial or something. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but it kept. She kept on moving her mouth, and it kept on her face, and I realized. Gosh, it's 5.30, this is the national news. So I turned it on and there was Anita saying, you know, and I think all gay people are going to go to hell and so forth. And then they switched it to these two young guys who had crew cuts and like, you know, gym bodies and suits and they were sitting in their dashing living room and they were saying, she's horrible, we hate her, you know, and so forth. And I said to myself, no, this is not the way this battle was going to be fought. So I called up the only activist I knew at that time was Priscilla, Alexandra. And I said, uh, hey, Priscilla, is there anything going on? And she said, yeah, there's a meeting tomorrow night. You want to come? So we went, and that led to this just incredible, huge meeting at the, at the Gay Community Center where there were just thousands of people. And I know I remember you being there. I think I remember you. Where was there? And I was Claude trying to Claude was there by your roommate. Yeah, Claude. And he, he, wasn't he the young African? He's back African by roommate again. Yeah. Is yeah. he the African American? Yeah. He was. He was great. Well, Claude and I were basically co-chairing the meeting. And it, it was incredible. And I just felt like there was so much energy there. And that I had no agenda other than just focusing and facilitating that energy. And Claude was the same way. And there was this huge debate over the name of the organization. and Whether or not it would contain the word gay, gay or not. That's right. It was either the Coalition for Gay Rights or the Coalition for Human Rights. And it got so hot at one point that I just remember handing the microphone over to Claude and saying, Claude, would you just try to deal with this, you know? And uh, it did come out being the Coalition for Human Rights because I think people were just scared. I mean, that's where things were. Well, I, think, I think people were scared, Celeste, but I also think that the people who wanted it to be called Coalition for Gay Rights, which within two years would have been too narrow anyway, right. as gay got more male-defined. Right. But I think the people who wanted it to be called the Coalition for Gay Rights were more committed to the big tent model of organizing. Right. That, well, if that's what it's going to take, to get everyone under this big tent, uh, including as many people as possible, will yield on the name. So be it. Right. And, and the whole business of the big tent model of organizing, I think, really connects back to the parade, mm -hmm. because it's the one big tent event of the entire year, not only in San Francisco, but in whatever cities hold it. Right. I mean, one of the questions. Right. May I, may I jump in there? Yeah, yeah. sure. Please I wanna, jump. I want to channel. <laughs> I want to channel Bill Burdimple. Good. <laughs> uh, 
for the like more for the camera, I think, than for this crowd. Okay. <laughs> but Bill was originally from New York and came out to San Francisco about 1963-64 with his partner John De Leon, who was a dancer, was Puerto Rican, and they were used to going out to dance in New York at the mafia control bars, and it was dancing was permitted. You, they, they, according to oral history, they all had French names. Uh, and you'd go upstairs and be a bar, and then you'd go downstairs and be the dance area. And if the cops were going to bust, they'd do a little light, and everybody was supposed to decouple and not touch. Uh, or that there were places where they could run. Bill remembers one time they exited through a sewer and actually came up through a man uh, into the streets of New York. <laughs> uh, literally, literally subterranean, literally exploited. Uh, which I think explains Stonewall on the East Coast. But they came out here and he said they wanted to dance. And there was no place in San Francisco to dance. Uh, so that was one of the impetuses be around starting SIR, which was, which was a switch away from the Mattachine Society. And SIR stood for um, specific, immediate, and realizable. The idea was it was like a Saul Alinsky neighborhood organizing concept that you go out to the people, instead of top down telling the people, this is what you need, and we'll tell you what you need, and, and then you come stuff the envelopes, or you volunteer, and we'll go lead for you. It was more like, let's go listen, let's get a group of people, a bunch of people in a room who want something, and then help them articulate it and figure out how to make it happen. And Bill said the only thing was whatever they wanted to do, it had to be specific, it had to be immediately actionable, and it had to be realizable. And that was, and Sir then began to develop political committees, and chess committees, and bowling committees, and drama committees, and et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't very male oriented. With a name like Sir. Sir. <laughs> but he did say it, it, did, it did have the largest membership of any gay rights organization prior to Stonewall, and Vector, prior to The Advocate, was the largest gay magazine available for distribution nationally, ultimately, later in the 60s. It was edited forward. by George Mendenhall. Yes. Originally by Bill, and then George Mendenhall. That's right. So then... And then Richard Kira. Yes, there was a variety. So what I, the reason why I brought this up is that Bill got involved with the parade in the early, uh, around 74. Because, as I said, Gary Allender, the first year they commemorated in Golden Gate Park, they had a gay in, the hippie, kind of hippie vari variation of a B in, gay hippie. Then in 71, my, there was nothing. And then in 72, Ray Brochiers took over organization of the parade. And Ray Brochiers, according to Bill Burdenfold, was a top down guy. It was my way or the highway. So he remembers in 73. That's being generous. He remembers Ray Brashears <laughs> being, being out in front of City Hall berating some lesbians. He had a megaphone, and they weren't doing it his way. And he began to hit them with the megaphone. And now, all, all I want to say is, is that whether this is true or not, what's interesting to me is that this was the story that Bill and John kept coming back to. There were two stories they kept coming back to about the parade. One was the need to dance and have fun and to have a bottoms up, grassroots, sort of community driven experience. And the other was this thing that they didn't like about the Stonewall generation that they called the gay livers because they felt that they were too much of this sort of communist cadre, we'll tell you how to get to your liberation, shut up and follow us, do it our way. So this image for me is very powerful of bro brochures on the steps of City Hall with a megaphone, beating people with a megaphone. And so Bill got involved the next year in 74, and then ultimately then in 75, 76, and then as it ballooned, he let go of it. But his, he, they said basically the whole point of it was to make it fun, and was to include as many people as possible, and to include women. And they were actually very proud of remembering Dice on Bikes, mm -hmm. of letting the women in and liking that name. Uh, and he said, 
that at one point in the interview, he said, what a hoot. <laughs> he said, he said uh, they wanted everybody to be themselves, that they wanted it to have floats and be a carnival and costumes, but the best of it was that people could just march in the parade and be themselves. And the parade was there for them to have fun and celebrate. And I really felt that that, not that it, it the, I think the, we could talk about the politics was really important, but I, what I learned in these older, act, these older activists is a lot of the political power and the political organization that came out of the homophile movement in the 60s was around the desire for people to have fun. They were not permitted to touch. They were not permitted to dance. They were not permitted to be, to publicly celebrate being gay. And the big fight was to fight for that public space. And for me, the biggest fight of the, of the parade was that they took it out onto the streets. More than just a neighborhood, because it started first along Polk Street, but down to Civic Center. But it really was like taking over the city, the city street. And that's sort of channeling Bill. <laughs> Channeling some of the older activists, I think that that was maybe their contribution of, of detesting, literally detesting Ray Brochure's model of what it meant to be gay, to organize gay, to, to try to bring people out into the public and to liberate yourself. They want to have a party. Ray, Ray, yeah. I'm going to ask Howard for his first country. I just want to yeah. say this is about Ray Brochures, which is Ray Brochures was a more or less ordained by someone or other minister with some pretty snarky connections to the National Student Association at Ohio State University at the time of the major infiltration of the CIA into the National Student Association. His record for disruption it in the gay community, and as it was called at the time, his the ratio of dis, of organization of disruption to organization was greater than one. That is, he managed to disrupt many more things than he managed to move forward. So, Bill Beardemple and Johnny DeLeon's view of him is not is not a, a solo limit. And in fact, Elliot Blackstone who was the first police department liaison to the gay community, as it was then called, uh, used to say that if Ray Brochures were killed, they'd have to hire a civic auditorium to house the suspects. And that that was widely said in the police department. By, by the way, John claims that when Ray Brochure, when they pushed Ray Brochures off of control of the parade committee, in retaliation, he went to their neighborhood and put queers live here on their house in the was in the Sanchez Street market area. They moved to what is now considered the Castro Sharon Street. Yes, okay. and they they had been in the hate, and they moved uh, there. And then in the early seventies, and he also put scrawled faggot on the street in front of them. And then he also put porn in the mailbox, gay porn, in the mailboxes of all the neighbors to incite anger at them. It was a provocateur. This is interesting historical gossip here. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, the thing is, it's in the Warren report also. <laughs> what I'm saying is it brings, up, it brings up, for me, these oral histories bring up more a sense of uh, why people felt the need for change. So I'd like to place the stories in brackets yeah. because the yeah. stories are more interesting as myths, mm -hmm. as what urged people to, to feel like they had to do something. Okay. Well, you know, I do kind of have a sense of the of the parade, even though I came in in '77. I felt that the cultural was very dominant, you know, in in, in that parade, and that uh, the political part of it was just kind of leaping ahead and people were trying to kind of run after it and get a hold on it. And that it was in 78 that the cultural and the political met, that it was sort of creative politics, political creativity, that we have just all got together and did it. So maybe at times beyond that, there were times when the political took over or they became totally separate. 
that there was the creative fun part and there was the political part. The political people were always in front, you know, and the, you know, the more creative they were, the further back they were. But for those, especially 78 They didn't get up as early as the political people that's to right. line up. <laughs> that's right. That there was this marriage of the two. Howard, uh, you get, why did you get involved? I think besides all the wonderful people I've met in the movement, um, I, th I felt from an early stage that we had some special allies, and that was our opponents. Uh, they were the most gloriously nutty opponents a movement could ask to be on the receiving end from. Mm -hmm. And it scared the hell out of the broad population and continues to do so. So even though uh, it was not a pleasant task to have to be on the receiving end of their punishments, uh, they were like our hidden uh, secret uh, salvation in terms of building the kind of tenacity that our movement has uh, stuck with. I argue with a Marxist friend of mine uh, that this movement was going to continue and get larger and larger and larger. He said, no, I don't think so. He had traveled wide, widely. He spent time in Europe as a correspondent. And uh, he said, they'll change the law like they did in England. And that would be that. Well, we can see today it's an issue in the presidential. There will be a, an, an, an issue in the presidential election. And 11 states had these overwhelming uh, votes uh, against gay marriage. Um, and uh, they had some wise strategy to it. They raised a lot of money off of us. We were a gold mine in terms of fundraising for the extreme right. Um, I started seeing these things and analyzing these things when I came to San Francisco. And I was in the closet at the time. I came here when I was 30. And I was in the closet, and I was dying to get out. I had moved here from Denver, Colorado, and I'd had over a decade. I started in high school. I had over a decade of politics. I started out joining an ACP and an ACLU when I was in high school, which was rare for a white boy at those times. And uh, I became a socialist in my 20s and was organizing. I was the best-known socialist in Denver. Did, you, did Denver have a parade? Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, but the, uh, what was the early, I want to say, Mash what was the Madison? early Madison, Madison Society? Madison Society held a convention there once. And I drove around and around and around the block. I didn't go in. That's how bad it was. We were on the tail end of the McCarthy period. And um, um, I was outspokenly challenging the McCarthy, McCarthy period and racism and a whole lot of things. And um, I just wasn't ready for it. Uh, Denver was not particularly conservative in that much respect, although in the suburbs we had some well-known fascists of the suburbs who were preachers. Um, when, when, I, when did you come to San Francisco? I came here in uh, 67, the summer of love, and I was 40 at the time. Uh, I'm sorry, I was 30 at the time. Uh, and I decided that at some point I'm going to come out of the closet. And uh, uh, it happened in 1970. I quit the socialist organization I was part of, which was a very interesting highly sophisticated organization, started internationally by Leon Trotsky, a founder of the Russian Revolution, second only to Lenin, and uh, one who paid with his life for opposing Stalinism. And um, they had, in the British Labor Party, there were a lot of Trotskyists, and the British Labor Party still are. Um, and in certain other countries, they played a significant force and played a huge role in the anti-war movement against the Vietnam War, where really the dominant organizing force in terms of getting thousands of people out on the street. And one of the first things I did when I got to town was to run a campaign, a voters' campaign, for immediate withdrawal from Vietnam and pass by an eyelash during the campaign. Um, 
ran a similar one here against uh, the war in Iraq in later years. But uh, one day I was organizing a, a demonstration that was to go from uh, the Embarcadero to uh, Golden Gate Park. And a friend of mine uh, who I'd spent time with, uh, who I'd, I'd stayed with, he and his wife when I first came to town, uh, and an old trust. Ex Trotskyus, not I say old. He looked like Gene, a young Gene Kelly. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, "Howard, can we get together tonight? Uh, I, I have something I want to talk to you about." And I said, "Okay, Jim, but I'm awfully busy right now." And right then, uh, a young gay man had come up from that we're going to consider having a gay speaker for the first time. This demonstration and. Uh, they had this young guy that, that Morris Kite set up, who was a young kid, barefoot, <laughs> sitting at the contingent table for uh, organizing lesbian and gay community for this march. And the march turned out to be um, it was an anti-war march. But was it one of the big moratoriums? It was. A, it was. It was. It was uh, what was it? April twenty-fourth, twenty-fourth, I think. I have it on a poster at home, but uh, 68 or 69? Of, or no, it's 70, I think. Okay. It's when was your first parade? Uh, I'm, I'm getting to that. Okay. So, uh, anyway, the, the anti-war parade uh, had was a huge parade. It had 400,000 people. Yeah, that was one of the more. And it went to Golden Gate Park. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Morris Kite was scheduled to be a speaker, <laughs> and unfortunately, Samal was from L.A attacked the program just before the last speaker came on, and Morris Kite didn't get to speak. <laughs> uh, he was on the tail end of the thing. But anyway, uh, that young guy who wanted to talk to me, who wanted to talk about how his wife came out of the closet. And uh, so I, I said I'd meet with him that night. We talked for two hours, and I was actually at the board. He talked about how he didn't understand women, and although he loved his wife, and he, you know, and wanted her to have, to be happy, but he is served and so on. He doesn't understand what he said. And he stayed at my house that night and he wound up climbing in bed with me. And, uh, and, uh, and that was the first straight person I told. Um, and uh, If he was straight. Yeah. Well, he was straight, actually. He was, uh, he, he, I mean, he said, he said, take it easy. I haven't done this since I was a teenager. And I said, I never did it when I was a teenager. I was a teenager. I wish I had. Uh, I thought of it a lot of times. Anyway, uh, I, I came sort of ready equipped to, to to embrace this movement, but I saw some of the narrowness of the movement and a lack of general, generally speaking, a strategic outlook. And I, I brought some of my own, some of them of organizing. You know, I did a lot of heavy duty organizing against police brutality and stuff. Dan Ren working with the Chicano movement for uh, Corky Gonzalez, uh, who's a friend of mine, against police brutality. So I tried to use a lot of that. And I wanted, to, and I and I brought uh, a young man, uh, Claude Wynn, who had also been part of the SWP. He used the organization and had come out when he joined them. He actually came out and he was listening to a, a KPFA type station, the Pacifica station in New York. He was raised in New York, black, young black person. And he's, he, he was listening to uh, the Pacifica station talking about this dance hall for gays. And he says, hey, I'm one of them. <laughs> he went down to that and he became an activist when he was 15. And I met him when he was 18. Anyway, he, he came to San Francisco specifically to help you build uh, a new movement within the gay community. And we joined, we spent uh, five months, five unendurable months sitting in. We were looking for other radicals. And they happened to unfortunately be Maoists. And each, each Sunday meeting, Sunday, losing a Monday, a uh, Sunday, by the way, uh, we, they'd go around the circles and they would analyze things. and rather badly, I think, and they would uh, complain. They, they, they believed in uh, 
things that Mao was saying, criticism and self-criticism. The criticism was of, of Claude and I, and the self-criticism was, they're too easy on Claude and I. <laughs> and so we, we, we jettisoned them, and after five months of that, and waved through the window one Sunday, because we couldn't decide who was going to go to, for the torture test each week. And, and we decided we were going to start a mass organization, and we were very, very mass oriented, not just narrow little groupets of ideological people, but we wanted to bring together everybody uh, who was ready to fight the homophobia and the, the sexism and, and anti-feminism in society. And we started an organization called Bagel. And in a nutshell, I'll just say that we hoped to get maybe 30 or 40 people at a meeting after heavy leafleting. Bagel wasn't about Sunday brunch. It was no. about Bay Area Gay Liberation, yeah. B-A-G-L. And we ran into uh, Hank Williams. Uh, Hank Wilson. Smith. Wilson, I'm sorry. I did that to another close friend the other day. <laughs> <laughs> I changed her name in the middle. Uh, 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 we ran into Hank Wilson. He started leafleting with us, and pretty soon, pretty other other people were helping leaflet with us. Uh, and we thought, gee, it's, it's catching on. They liked our opening statement because it talked about this is a. We know that there are thousands of lesbians and gays in San Francisco, uh, and had been for quite some time since World War Two, the end of World War Two, um, and maybe from the gold. struggle for gold in California. We knew that, but we said uh, it's not registered on the, on the, uh, in American li in, in San Francisco life, so, in the media, and so on. So how did Bagel get involved in the parade? Uh, we went for about a year, and we decided we wanted to embrace this parade and, and not have something organized by Reverend, uh, what's his name? Brochures. Brochures, who was a uh, really loony person uh, and highly destructive. Uh, and we wanted it very broad based. And uh, we went a little hesitantly, hesitantly to uh, Bear Dimple and tried to explain we're not interested in some big ideological thing. Yes, we're going to argue for our things maybe in a banner or so, so on. The big thing was come out, come out. We knew that was very important. Uh, and we knew that a lot of people who weren't coming out, it was only because they were suffering and they were afraid uh, that it could, might demolish their career, lose their job, and, or, or narrow their lives. I remember when I was in Denver, sitting on the edge of a bed after having spending the night with a guy, and I was smoking a cigarette. And uh, I managed to uh, throw that away. When I got to San Francisco with a heart, open heart surgery. Anyway, we were sitting on the edge of the, and I was smoking a cigarette with him, and uh, I was, I was, he suggested that I should come out. He was from New York, and uh, I, he says you'll you'll find out who your real friends are, and I thought that's what I'm afraid of, and, and that's what a lot of people felt. So, yeah. so I was just, it's just. The reason we embraced this, and we weren't ideological, we had a program that was to, to call for, our, our initial purpose was liberation of gays and lesbians. Mm -hmm. But we had another side to it too. Our secondary but highly important goal was to link up with allies who suffered in their own way in society. Workers who were exploited, uh, people of color who were s suffered from racism, people who suffered from sexism of any kind, and people who suffered for econo on, on economic grounds. And, uh, and we just said we should reach out and, and join with them wherever we feel we can find common cause with it. I'm, I'm really intrigued, Howard, by your description of the, the connection with Beer Devil, because in a way, what I see that as was a meeting of a, a, an old, a older generation in the queer sense, of 10 years or five years, but an old, older group of, of lesbian and gay activists who 
owned homes and owned businesses and didn't quite understand or were the gay liberation, the younger, more hippie-ish, maybe more socialist, but generally more leftist. But but that that parade committee from 19, the 1975 coalition was of business people, mm -hmm. big tent business people, with the big tent leftists and progressives. And that most, neither, most of neither us were fine one, with that. That neither one felt that, that you didn't have to agree with the people you were working with. You just had to agree on ground rules for how do we how do we make it so that everybody who wants to can, can, can we wanted can come out. We wanted inclusiveness. Yeah, from the start. And that and that that is a coalition which I think is more or less endured in in the whatever it's called yeah. today. Right. Yeah, we were, we were, we, were, we, we in later years yeah. we were critical of some of the commercialism yeah. and so on, and we we managed to get the tourist boycott appreciated by the parade committee. Right, but I, I think that people were complaining about commercialism even in '77 and '78. Yeah. I want to get a little bit more granular and and, and also. Can I, can I just interject yeah. one thing yeah. here? Uh, I'm looking at the notes from Bird Apple. He was talking more about the sur dances, but I think it it, it has applicability here. Um, it's kind of hard to uh, for us to wrap our heads around. The first Sir Dance in 64 at the basement of California Hall had 500 people and it had a live band. It was a union hall too. Yeah, and they and the uh, Bill Plath, who is big homophile activists, and Bill Bernample hadn't seen each other for years, and I interviewed them after maybe they, so, so there's no way they could have colluded mm -hmm. on inventing a memory. It's really interesting, they have the exact same memory, that the band started, and 500 people rushed to the center and almost shouted, and they were so excited and so liberated about being together in such large numbers, and to kind of let go, and celebrate themselves, celebrate being gay. And I felt like that was San Francisco in the 70s, that was exponentially. Right. No, that was 64. 64. 64, and as I was trying to say, it was sort of a journey of public spaces from a private dance in a basement out onto a neighborhood and then a whole street in the city. And what he was saying about that is that Sir Dance, he also said, raised, again, in 1964, they charged five bucks a ticket. So they raised a lot of money, and he said that money went directly into political action and into publication, into organizing, uh, legal defense funds. So he said a lot of people necessarily can be supportive of political action without necessarily wanting to be directly political. And, he's, and another thing he had to say about this is, it, is that um, for people to be That's able to That's why charities have benefit parties. Right. And I want to, <laughs> what I want to say about this is he said, and this is a generation two that this is what they grew up with. A lot of people made a lot of money off of gay people. And it, there was a shift in San Francisco in the early 60s where gay people began to make money off of gay people, but they also began to use their facilities to let people, gay people, make money for themselves for their own causes. And that Sir Dance is sort of the beginning of it. And so when you get back into issues around commercialization of the parade, which I think is a legitimate debate, nonetheless, I sometimes think we forget like how much how much the world is transformed. Yep. From, from people just controlling us, controlling where we can be, making money off of us, exploiting us, to our our ability to exploit ourselves. <laughs> I've got to say, the freedom to exploit ourselves. <laughs> uh, we are truly important. liberated. Fun is an important value. Right. I mean, I, I mean, if I think back to the '70s or further back to the '60s or my upbringing in the '50s, the concept of having fun in a way I wanted to have. Which was, which would be hanging out with men, some of whom maybe might want to spend the night with me, 
and hanging out with women where I didn't have to pretend that I wanted to spend the night with them, and just being able to treat them as people, was a, having fun was political. We weren't supposed to have fun. We were supposed to, Eric Rofs wrote that wonderful, the head, it was terrible, I mean, it, the problem was terrible, but his, his article on, su his book on suicide was titled, I thought people like that killed themselves. And that's the people, that was, those are the models we knew, you know? So having fun was political. Well, but be, yeah. it still required organization. When you're, when you're talking about getting 100,000 yeah. people on the main street of, of a major American city. So I'm going to ask Celeste about the 1978 parade. Because, about, with a couple, sort of, you can, I'm going to focus in on a couple of points, which is that was the first year that the parade had money from the hotel tax fund in its budget. Because the year before, there was a last minute supplemental grant for extra monitors because of the murder of Robert Hillsborough had raised tensions. So what was what were the relations like with the city? Okay, well, first of all, I, I want to kind of okay. pick up on a little bit of what's been going sure. on here. And I, I think that, you know, we're talking about having fun, but there's also the issue of commodification. And, you know, to me, a lot of identity, not only on the part of gay people, but on the part of a lot of people black people now, is through consuming, um, and I think you know, I, ideally, any really decent political movement is going to be fun. I mean, if it isn't fun, then forget it. You know, and I, to some Emma extent, Goldman. I feel that <laughs> no. I, that there should be a woman here who could bring that insight from the early uh, gay women organizing, you know, in San Francisco and in other parts of the country. I don't bring that perspective. I bring the perspective of the uh, feminist women's liberation movement in the late 60s and the early 70s, where I have will never had so much fun. Frankly, if I had lived a thousand years, I would never have had so much fun. It was, I mean, just the memories were incredible. And the second time, the second period of my life when I had almost that much fun, were the late 70s, with the, with the, uh, the influx of women and men together in, the, in the, um, the gay, lesbian movement at that time. So yeah, having fun. Now, as far as the city is concerned, I think, uh, I'm not sure who was dealing with the city, but I certainly wasn't. Uh, maybe Paul, um, you know, the guy who was in charge of the gay Paul community Hardware. center. Yeah. Because my, what I did, because I was basically the salary coordinator, as well as the co-chair, was that I just worked with everybody to spend the money. And also did try to raise extra money. I remember for the, um, the flags, the, you know, 78 was like a, a formative year where a lot of these traditions started. The gay marching band, the gay men's chorus with Tandy Ballou. Um, the uh, Fairy Argyle and Gilbert with the flags uh, for the first time, you know, and a lot of people remember Gilbert, but they may not remember Fairy Argyle, and she's the one who actually did all the flags, practically. Um, this, you know, wonderful bisexual woman who just worked day and night to produce the flags. Um, the, you know, I know Dykes on Bikes had been there for a long, long time, but it seemed like it had just mushroomed in that, in those two years. 77, 78. 77, yeah. 78. And um, so I think the issue was more spending the money. I do remember our meeting with the cops, with the chief of police, and I, I don't know if you were there. I think you were, Howard. I know Paula was there, and the chief of police was oh, very... Oh, Lichtenberg. yeah. He was very upset that things were getting so big, and I, I really who was think the, who was that the chief? I don't was remember it Con who Murphy was. or <laughs> before Con Murphy. I think the one yeah. so it would have been Con still Murphy. Charles Gain because Maybe it was so. still that George Moscone was mayor, mm -hmm. and, and they really didn't have any sense that this was bringing in tourism and so forth. And I sort of feel that '78 was much much bigger than '77. Um, and I Bill's think that thing my own kind of personal sense is that probably 79 was the biggest parade 
ever. You know, not just before, but after. It was huge. Um, I know that, every year a million people came out, but that's not true. I mean, right. it's like sometimes, you know, you can see lots of spaces in between the people. That's but, interesting because 77 was the year of Anita Bryant and the Hillsborough. And also Walter Mondale. There was a huge demonstration about, about um, well, I think it's 78 was John Driggs. But 79 yeah. and 80 were the last parades after that media challenge. Yeah. And also, 79 was the first parade after the assassinations. Right. And 79 was Carl 79. Hill, too. But, Remember, yeah, Carl Hill. But 79 and 80 before we started with AIDS. I think there was a big difference, too, between 79 and 80 because 79 was, um, I sort of, yeah, I can lounge a lot. Um, 79 was kind of, we were liberated from this huge political onus, but at the same time, the assassination was just, you know, on everybody's mind. So it was still very political, but, um, you yeah. know, it And the was, parade was like five weeks after the White Night Riots. Right, and also the Christian, uh, you know, backlash was just enormous in 79. I mean, everywhere you turn, there were these guys, you know, sneering or women or whatever, with their signs, you know, Christ is going to murder gay people and, you know, epithets. And um, I, I, I do remember that, you know, I gave the invocation in 79 and came up with this stream of goddesses and gods and so forth, and they were just, you know, all, everybody was just raising their arms, and it was, it was really sort of the height of paganism in the gay movement. It may not have been the height of the gay movement because I really think that came later after, during and through the struggle of AIDS. But um, there was this real division going on and I, and I think about that often, how, um, you know, what might have happened if, you know, if AIDS had not been there, you know, at that time. But in a sense it provided the Christian right with a rationale that, you know, they're always saying things like, well, you know, God sent Katrina to punish New Orleans because of the gay parade. But really, they didn't believe it. But they can actually believe that God sent AIDS, you know. There was a kind of historical turn there that when I think about what happened in 1979 and that huge division between the kind of gay, pagan, joyous, celebrating ourselves and, you know, this really vicious backlash that was developing, I think it was really sad what took, you know, the turn that, that took place after that. Randy, I wonder, this is a speculation, because I, I don't know. I do know that, what I do know is that the earlier homophile generation, which extends through the 60s and up to the early 70s, their big victory was 76, the repeal of the sodomy statutes in, San, in, in, in California. That was the big deal for them. Uh, they, they actually spent a lot of time developing contacts with the city infrastructure. The police, the mayor's office, the Department of Public Health, because that was sort of where we fell in some regards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the anti-war movements the Vietnam War movements, the civil rights movements, unleashed huge street demonstrations in America, major American cities. Because a lot of the ministers who were involved with uh, Council on Religion and the Homosexual talked about participating in sit-ins here in San Francisco and in being in major civil rights marches, also in Selma, back in the South, but also here in San Francisco. So I'm wondering whether there was this happy, this happy uh, confluence of a city that got used to big marches that could be not just a Chinese parade, Chinese New Year's parade, well, we learned but could be something else. To, yeah, but, the, learned, but the, 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 earlier, excuse me, the earlier home file activists kind of paved the way for the city to be prepared to talk to gay people. So that when gay and lesbian or queer people came to the city, they weren't freaked out. They didn't know what to do. There was already a dialogue that was established for about 10 years. Because Willie Brown, Diane Feinstein, 
George Moscone, they had all had to come and dress Sir and other organizations address their political committees to court votes. You know, Willie Brown and Diane Feinstein were running ads in Vector in '68, and they were right. well re rewarded. For us. But Willie Brown has been in parades, and Diane Feinstein still has not. I know, yeah. but I, you know what I'm getting at, though. I'm just saying that the city was used to yeah. talking to us, which makes a difference. What, what, what? So, in terms of mappability of that, then. What was, we know 78, there was some interface with the Chamber of Commerce, but what happened in 79? Because if that flourished, then that would be a mappable way to sort of chart the, how the mechanism works. So the the Chamber of Com Commerce took no position on the Drake's initiative and the labor movement. No, but on the producing of the parade, they gave oh. us money. Oh, no, that no, was that's actually that's the hotel tax. The hotel, hotel tax. tax. Right. That's not the chamber of commerce. No, separate. different. No. Different. But the labor that, movement. Meant hotel tax. The labor so. movement put money and forces into defeating Briggs, and uh, well, because it was a labor issue, they were going to fire people. Yeah. They, we for we made it not just a lesbian <laughs> and gay issue. We right. made it both. It was yeah. a human rights issue. Right. It was a lesbian and gay issue, and it was a threat to education in the state of California. And we and some of us argued publicly that if we lose in this election, we'll really push the lesbian and gay issue, the gay liberation issue at the school's level because it will be intolerable. It'll mean we've forsaken a rational public education system in California. Plus, the schools would have lost a lot of people. Right. So we yeah, used a fear yeah. level, yeah. and at the same time, a positive level that yeah. we we can rid ourselves of this scum <laughs> with a simple vote and get it out of the way. Yeah. Um, going back, we had this whole plan around not only getting the hotel tax fund money, but showing how much it was working and therefore trying to increase it for the next year. So one of the things I did, I spent days on the phone calling all the hotels, asking them how booked they were. Well, it turns out a lot of them were 90 and 100% booked for that weekend. And this was a month or two ahead. And so we used that in publicity for the stuff, because we had those great, uh, remember that huge publicity thing around the flags and everything at 330 Grove? Yeah. We did this whole thing, it was really smart, see? Yeah. Um, and we did this whole thing about stuff. how the hotels were booked, right? And, yeah. and that the hotel tax fund was working, that our hotels, that the parade was booking hotels for the 1978 parade, right. and it worked, and, and our jump went from 78 to 79, I think there was this huge jump, and we didn't have to argue anymore. Right. 78, yeah. we had to argue for the money. But yeah. because we'd done all this research about how the hotels were so well booked for yeah. 78, we jumped in 79, and I don't remember what the jump was. Well, that's The true. other thing yeah. that was really good financially in 78 was, if we remember, it was GGBA. Remember how big GGBA was then? Did I don't know. the camera with GGBA? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Golden Gate Golden Business, Business Association. Association. They were huge yeah. then. Mm -hmm. They were a big contingent in the 77 yeah. parade, and that totally took them off, and they got all the dentists and the physicians right. and you know store owners and doggy walkers and everything that was GDBA. Yeah. And they also helped with our funding in 78, because they had that great we fundraiser that was their money I Love a Parade. We supported the gay men's chorus, I think. Yeah, and, and they, they also did that I Love a Parade. Yeah. Um, yeah. Remember that I Love a Parade yeah. fundraiser? with right. the guy from uh, ABC, the cute blonde guy. Right. And Bob Ross was one of the ones that helped with that. And then Roger Gross from GDPA. They raised like five or $8,000 for us, and that was just before the beginning of the 78 parade, and it really well, helped you us. You should be out here, Glenn, because your memory is so clear. <laughs> I, I forget the part that it had to do with all that. I just remember the, the flags and the, you know, the goddess yeah. float. That's something I really know. One, one, of, one, of, one of the trademarks of the time too was everybody became uh, a propagandist to a certain degree just by saying come out come out wherever you are mm -hmm. and uh, in the early yeah. stage when I just started getting to know Harvey well I gave him this book a thin book a friend of mine wrote on the early history of uh, uh, homosexual movement in Germany and part of the story was David Forstad wrote it years ago it was just a slim book, uh, but Harvey used that book constantly. Uh, it told about how this movement arose, and it was in the Weimar period, 
a great amount of freedom and experimentation, sexually among other things, and artistically, and in many ways, culturally. Uh, and the Nazis reacted against that and destroyed it all. Uh, and Harvey used to stand up in his speeches and hold up this book and talk about how, you know, it can happen here too. You know, the more we come out, the more we'll make it more difficult to stop them in their tracks. And it became uh, something that actually spread. And we pointed to the, the campaign in, uh, in Florida that was defeated by, by uh, what's her name? Anita Bryant. Bryant. Uh, we pointed by that as a, as a negative example of how a campaign shouldn't be run. Uh, Jack Davis was given a job for the first time, uh, and he called me up and said uh, he was given the job of turning gay people away who were offering to help the campaign from coast to coast. Thousands of people right. were calling there. And he was given by, uh, who was the editor of the Advocate, uh, Goodstein. publisher, Goodstein. David Goodstein. Um, and it was, it was Goodstein to Jack Campbell, yeah. the owner of the club bass. Yeah. And Campbell wasn't as bad. Campbell at least worked, tried to work with some of the more progressive minded. They didn't want, people. To, they didn't want people to meet gay people. They didn't want to, they, they were afraid some effeminate guy would scare, scare everybody away. It was nonsense. It would have helped immensely for people to understand people, which we did in San Francisco. We created Bacabi, and there were thousands of people in shopping centers and so on. That really made it real. And those defeats from Bryant, where was a mass march here, uh, led by people like Hank and uh, Cleve Jones and a number of feminists. Uh, there were there was the one in in uh, Minnesota, and finally the final one was Wichita, so St. Paul, and Eugene. Saint, right. Yeah. Those, Those things are all. In the marches years. kept getting bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger, and it helped Harvey's campaign also. Um, I, I, I just let, want to let point me out say another one thing okay. quickly about the police. Yeah. I wanted to sure. complete that that um, we met with the chief of police, and he was so upset that so many people were coming into the city. And he looked at us, and he said, "Think small." <laughs> <laughs> we all just kind of you know looked around. We didn't want to get arrested or anything, right. but it was like, "Think small." And I do remember that the police was were very the unfacilitating. The we weren't supposed to be bringing all these people in. We were supposed to have a very small, well-managed little, you know, yeah. event. And I do remember that, you know, they would stop. They stopped the parade to let traffic through on a lot of the intersections, and that resulted in some huge delays in the parade. Yeah, that still happens. Yeah, to yeah. it oh, does, but it sounds bad. Yeah. I. Um, let me just say that the experience I've had interviewing people, many, I just feel like I'm resonating. So I'm just going to throw out a few very brief experiences. I think they'll make sense. Uh, 1948, Stuman versus Riley, the key case in which the California Supreme Court surprisingly reversed every court decision before that upheld the law that made it illegal to serve alcohol to a known homosexual. In a, in a bar or in a, staff, you know, a tavern establishment. <laughs> Supreme Court overturned it unanimously. Uh, why should you care? Because it was about public assembly of homosexuals. And it equality permitted, before the law, too. It permitted public assembly and equality before the law, and it also, didn't, it also said that how can you know that this class of individuals is identifiable? How do you identify a homosexual? That was what came up in, before the court. And those questions, it unleashed a set of circumstances that I think also ultimately led to the parade. Another thing I think flashed forward is Herb Donaldson, first gay judge in California, who was arrested at California Hall, along with uh, three, about four or five other people. He said to me that after California Hall, they sued the city. <laughs> and they held that lawsuit over the city for harassment. And that kind of kept the city in check. But they also started the, the Sur uh, political nights, where they made the candidates come. And they essentially, he said, 
they basically went out and they, they said, there's a lot of gay people in San Francisco. He said, we don't really know how many gay people there were in San Francisco. We don't know how much we could really deliver on the threat. But for the first time, you could come and you'd have, he said they could fill the church hall at Glide with five, 600 people for a candidate's night. And suddenly everybody stood up and paid attention and said, wow, there's gay people. And they're right. organized. Because if there's 600 people here, there's five or 10 times that many who are in their social So system. I just, the strength in numbers, last thing I wanted to say, yeah. excuse me, last thing I want to say about strength in numbers, which is, a, uh, I interviewed again Gary Allender, who would grow up in the Midwest on a dairy farm and traveled to New York and became very involved with the hippie, yippie scene and was at the sit-in in Pentagon. <coughs> and knew, knew uh, the yippies, the, the head yippies in New York, and actually came out to Berkeley in 69 because he really thought this is where it was happening. He thought New York had kind of burned itself out, and this is where the heat of the radicalism was. But he tells a story, I remember, and it came out by accident, that during all this time when he was this intense anti-war, countercultural protester and demonstrator, he was in the closet. And the reason why he couldn't come out of the closet was all the, how do you identify queer, right? The queer people that he saw were down in the village area, and there were like older, what he called basically older queens, and some other kinds of gay men, and he couldn't identify with them. He said, that's not me. And then he said he was coming out of his apartment building, and he saw these two hippies, these two guys, and they were holding hands. And he said, wow. You can be hippie, and you can be gay. He had never occurred to him. And I think if I pull all the strands together, many of the activists, older activists that I interviewed, said two of the things in, that they saw as a legacy of their work that overwhelmed them was the parade. They thought never in their lifetime would they see that. And they also said one of the things that most amazes them is to watch young people walking down the street holding hands and thinking nothing of it. Like, what a radical act that was. So if I were to sum it up, or try to sum it up, one thread that pulls it together, about the parade that's amazing, is that all these people, men and women, bisexual people, I think very beginning of transgender, drag, dykes on bikes, all these different kinds of people came together, and, and I think what permits a mass movement is the more different kinds of people there are, the more people can identify, because being gay or queer or lesbian is not just one thing. It is a mass movement, but I think we were all kind of prisoners earlier about you have to look like this or you have to look like that. Vertical talks about the first protest back east with Kameny, 64-65, mm -hmm. where they went out in front of the White House and they had strict dress codes. I mean, for good reason. They were freaked out. They wanted to put on a good, good impression. But men had to look like well-dressed men. Women had to wear skirts and hose and pumps. And they, and they had to have short cropped hair and nice, nicely coiffed for the women. And so I, I, you, I just feel like the explosion, the liberation in what could be defined as queer is really, I think, one of the things that creates a self-perpetuating cycle is once you get enough people out there that people can identify with, then, then you can't you can't cork the bottle. Right. Well, well then the Harvey's then Harvey's mythical or legendary or prototypical archetypal kid in Altoona, because there are so many people who are out and the media can't ignore us and people's own eyes can't ignore us. That kid now knows he's not alone or she's not alone that, oh, I'm not the only one. There are, there are other people out there. I'm going to be able to grow up and leave my home and find people who understand me better than my parents. Or maybe my parents are going to understand me better than I ever thought they would because of all of this happening. And you know, even before it became broad, broadly accepted that we should come out, there was a victory that when I first came to town, I was still in the closet. It was a victory that was won silently. It spread all over the city. And I can't remember the guy's name. Maybe you recognize who I'm talking about. It was somebody who was running for office, and he developed a reputation of being very anti-gay publicly. And you'd go, into, you'd go in the back to 
room or something to a gay bar, or you go to the go to the bathroom, and and a little poster would be up in every single restroom <laughs> in every gay bar in the city, trashing the shit out of this guy. <laughs> it was just a smile, you know. You, you didn't see who was putting them up. All you saw was this thing right in front of your eyes. And he lost them. And every oh, he lost by a big margin, and it became the talk of the town among straights and gays. You know that this guy was expected to move ahead and climb politically. And he was dashed to pieces by this rather quiet uh, attack for being anti-gay. So I see a, yeah. Um, the other thing that I think goes along with what Paul was saying was when um, Jose Saria ran in 61. And didn't he get 6,000 votes? Yeah. They really took, people really took that seriously. But he got 6,000 votes in 1961, running out of the black cap. <coughs> no, Jose oh, Soria was the, okay. was the drag, drag okay. performer okay. of the black right. cap. Okay. Yeah. That was a big deal yeah. in 61. That showed that we had a lot of cloud, I thought. Mm -hmm. back then. I mean, I, I, I resonate with, to use your term, Paul, about what you said about the early the movement people from the 60s saying they never thought it would get to be like that. And I, I was involved in, as I said, the, the mid seventies, from seventy four all the way through the late 78, 79, 78. And the other morning, when I came up out of Bart on my way to work, and saw that, and you can see them through the window here, that there are rainbow flags up and down Market Street for the entire month of June, not just in the Castro. It's the main street in a major American city, and. Those definitely LGBT symbols are up there for the whole month saying it's Pride Month. It's it's here, it's here for the whole month, you know, and like I I never thought I'd see that. That we have you know, I mean I thought even getting the parade onto Market Street after it was forced to be just in Polk Street or just going through the financial district on a Sunday where, where there's nobody, you know, to being on Market Street. And now we have the flags up for a whole month. And people don't even, it's taken for granted. Well, yeah, gee, San Francisco is a queer city, isn't it? It's supposed to be like that. Well, it took a lot of very difficult meetings. It took budgets, it took organizing, it took work from Howard, it took work from Celeste work from the, the pioneers that Paul represented, it, I don't think it was all automatic. And it took hundreds of thousands of people on the street. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that it certainly wasn't automatic, and I think that, um, you know, sort of my experience of, of what happened is in, in, in some ways very different from yours, because I came in as a lesbian feminist, and a lot of the things that you're talking about I experienced as a lesbian feminist within a separate culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I think to me, what really, I, I think that, you know, the culture, the issues, and the, in, the coalition orientation and the influx of women are all inseparable. But I think it was that combination of factors and very much the the fact that suddenly it became a broad coalition, that it was that it became very co-sexual in 1977, 78, 79, and you know, I, I, I think that that was somehow since I was part of that, that, that was really important. That we have oh, to it, understand it that it wasn't just that you know that there was something happening that was broader than what was happening from within. I think what I'm hearing from these, you know, wonderful people who lived through all of this is a kind of endogamous inward perspective, whereas what I have more is this, you know, outward perspective of people coming together to accomplish something. And I think that's what caused the surge. It was the coalition element. Well, mm -hmm. some of us yeah. had that as an essential part of our policy. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I we think supported that's the equal rights and so, uh, yeah, right. Absolutely. Bagel right. campaign heavily right. on. Yeah. But I agree. But I mean, to have it as part of your agenda, and yeah. I think that you certainly operated in circles, but to have it as part of your agenda and to have it actually happen mm -hmm. are two different things. Right. Right. And I think that when it made it actually happen, 
It was issues driven. It was not just culturally driven, it was driven by the issues. Women came out because of the Aeneas Bryant thing. Um, women came out because of the BRICS initiative. Actually, the, the, and also the ERA did one. Uh, the e well, the ERA and, well, I think the ERA actually died um, a couple of years after. Well, when that, it, when yeah, it died, too. Yeah. It, it we slammed. had a big demonstration. Yeah, it, it, was a, it was a catastrophe yeah. because of, what was it, two states, well, you only need two more states to get to equal rights amendment. Yeah. And, um, right. you know, in my opinion, uh, the right was saying, oh, this is going to be used for homosexuals, too, and so on. They used that as part of the baiting of the yeah, defeated. Was, yeah. um, but in fact, it would have been used by all Americans uh, because it would have, it would have uh, created more unity on the, in the workforce of people pay for equal work. And uh, a lot of blessings would have come from that that was just closed down. It was one of the great political tragedies, I think. Of the 20th century. I think the timing too is that uh, it was the year after it was legal to be homosexual in California. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, up to 1976, it was illegal. A lot of professionals, I remember interviewing um, Hector, who was the third emperor of San Francisco, who was a uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on it. He, he worked with uh, uh, no, he wasn't. I, but I did work with a, Don Lucas couldn't be an accountant because of moral turpitude clauses. A lot of professionals, including hairdressers who had to get their licenses through the state, were restricted because of moral turpitude clauses. So instead of being accountants, they would be bookkeepers. Instead of being professionally licensed hairstylists, they would be maybe a, a, a hair cutter. They would have to do a, a, a rank down and on the side, or a little bit of quasi-legal, so that they, because they had to so long that. Um I can't believe I'm blanking on this. The guy, when you go to the, the drugstore, who, make, who gives oh, you the your pharmacist. prescription, the pharmacist. Yeah. Hector yes, was Hector a pharmacist. Was a pharmacist. Right. Yeah. And he said to me, uh, they were not really able to organize queer professionals and a lot of business people until the moral turpitude clause was revoked. And he remembers Senator Mer Milton Marks who got that revoked around 73, 74, and then in 76, he had the more blanket prescription against homosexuality. Kind of just the turpitude of being gay. Right. Right, was revoked. And I, and I think it's a confluence of many factors, but I think that was part of taking it off, getting lots of people. And again, this is about why would so many people come out and feel comfortable being out? Because they know they can't get arrested. Just for being yeah. Yes, and that was always a problem. Just for holding Or just being seen, being on television. Right. Right? Uh, it was huge. That's why those uh, those uh, court uh, victories were extremely valuable, too. Uh, Thurgood Marshall and the NACP was doing us all a favor by winning so many suits. You know, when he finally went on the Supreme Court, he had won more suits than any other living human being. But uh, those precedents for a whole lot. That's why we got to watch the Supreme Court. I'd like to do a shout out too to, um, to in honor of Carol Hilder, who couldn't come tonight. I don't know. I know. I guess Randy, you tried to find her. Tried to find her. She um, but she was the '77 co-chair. Right. Prior to, uh, and I think she was the first women's co-chair. I don't. I don't know mm -hmm. who the co-chairs were in '76. There, '76 had a series of three or four co-chairs, one who was in charge of each of the committees, one who was in charge of parade, one of the celebration, one of outreach. And I think only one of the four co-chairs was, uh -huh. was a woman in 76. Well, the re reason why I want to honor Carol is that I met her at meetings both in Berkeley and San Francisco in the spring of 77 when she was doing outreach to the women's community. Mm -hmm. And that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And she's the one that organized that women's contingent banner that's in the front of the parade. And, and she didn't have to argue, or maybe she did argue with Chuck Lee Morris, her co-chair that year, the publisher of the Sentinel, to allow the women in the front. Okay? I was just well, remembering. And, and she really organized a, a really large women's contingent. And she spoke all over town saying she wanted women, she wanted our sisters to come to the parade. 
And if a man had done that, I don't think it would have worked as well. Right. But she got, and she was well known in the East Bay. She was a big, big wig over there. And she got a lot of women to come to the parade. And once that all happened, then all of a sudden we started feeling but comfortable. The, right. The successful model. So she, I think she yeah. really has a lot to do with why there's so women. In, so many she does. Women. And the and successful model of the 70 of, like, let's have a women's contingent at the front of the parade. That was huge. To, to widen the parade and make Different. it much larger. Came and she was, invited dykes on bikes. Was, was right. But it was, ba it was in a way, it was modeled on the 75 parade when... The, the Bay Area Gay Liberation Group that went to the parade committee said, look, the parade could be much bigger if you open it up with just people instead of floats and convertibles and, and contingents and just sort of let's invite the, the Stonewall contingent. And, and so the, the, that same concept was applied. And I was working in 77. I was working for Charles Lee Morris at the Sentinel. And he was a little bit hesitant, somewhere between hesitant and resistant. And I think the real winning argument was he, he had seen what happened the last time, the previous time that the same form of organization had been used, which is it went from 3,000 people to 10,000. And the idea was, oh, you mean we could triple the size of the parade and go from 15,000 to 45,000. As I said, that was the year when there was a huge confluence of events. There was it was in, not simply Anita Bryant and the campaign in Florida, but the national organizing around it with an orange juice boycott. And then the tragedy of the Hillsboro murder just two and a half weeks before, which mobilized people. But also the mass marches that were before the Hillsboro, mm -hmm. starting on the night of Orange Tuesday from mm -hmm. the gay community center. The huge meetings that were packed to the rafters at at 330 Grove where floors had been taken out and so there was like this series of five galleries like La Scala except it was political La Scala and it's the only time I've those there were two nights in a row it's the only time I've ever seen a place packed to the rafters people were hanging on to the ceiling rafters and it had that electricity that you described if you'll excuse my comparison, I, I said at the time to, to a number of old radicals, it looked like the Petrograd Soviet, <laughs> because there are pictures of two levels in, in some of the revolutionary uh, history. And it shows a huge crowd on the ground, and it shows all these people with their arms hanging down and their legs hanging down yeah. from laugh rafters all around. And it was just perfect. <laughs> it yeah. was, you, you took a look at that and you said, we're on our way. This is going to be a powerful right. movement as soon yeah. as you saw that. And, it was, and, and I think in retrospect, it wasn't the powerful movement that we dreamed of that night any more than the hippie movement or the environmental movement or any of those other things turned out exactly the way we thought. But boy, things sure have changed. The spirit was alive, yeah. excited. You know, Celeste, you 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 mentioned this to to be fair. I had interviewed Phyllis and Dell, mm -hmm. plus another woman, Lois. Well, her actual name is Lois Peavy, but she had to use Lois Williams because she worked for Sylvania and had to have a security uh -huh. clearance. But the DOB started as a organization for women to get together and socialize and dance. It was like coits. Coits started as a place where they would put money in a coffee can and uh, have beverages and cookies and they clear the floor and they dance because <laughs> you couldn't you couldn't get together and have fun and actually Phyllis and Dell left the DOB in the mid 60s to join now and because they began to chafe under the fact that a lot of the women didn't want to be political they just wanted to have a social organization Lois Williams talked about the tensions uh, and that there were some women who just sort of stayed there. There were other women who went and put their energies into the women's rights movement, into women's liberation, and that there was a break a lot with men at that time, that they all say was not healed until the parade of 77, which also makes it really significant. The, the other, um, it's like channeling all these old stories here. <laughs> I'm trying to think there was uh, I've, I've, uh, there was one of that I can't think of it right I've lost it but I wanted to you had mentioned 
to be fair, there is an, an interesting equal push in the early women's homophile organizing that mm -hmm. comes from that same yeah. need of people yeah. to gather and feel good. And from that, Del, Del said that. She said, you can't have a mo movement if people don't feel good about themselves. She said, we had internalized homophobia. We didn't know how to, we didn't have that word. We didn't know how to clarify it or right. say it. But when you have that, it will cripple you from within. No matter how many friends you have on the outside and how many dedicated activists you have, like a cadre, you're just not going to get anywhere until enough people feel good. Yeah. I mean, even political people are people, and we have social needs as humans. Right, and, and I think that in a sense, the innate, intrinsic quality of gay politics is our culture and our identity. In other words, that's what it is about, that we have to be who we are. So, you know, it automatically becomes a marriage of culture and politics. I think, I think in 77 there was struggle. I mean, I remember there was struggle around women and the women's issue. And I remember that we didn't know if women would show up. I think there was some struggle around the issues and the importance of visibility. And that didn't just happen. There was struggle over it. And it was a mindful, conscious thing. And it was a um, calculated thing. The thing, that, the thing that I remember was women did show up. And that was, that was fascinating because we, we didn't know. And I think that it, I think that it created a momentum, a momentum of its own. I don't, think the, I don't think all the women that showed up knew that that was going to happen either. I mean, I don't, I don't know, but I think that I think we were all surprised. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it kind of created a momentum that then it brought just being together. And I remember, um, I remember some of the spontaneous things. People used to do stuff to like entertain ourselves. There was a lot more fairyism. I think in some of those early days where groups would, um, they weren't, they were, they were doing it for joy, for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of miss some of that now. Yeah. Um, and I also think there was an attitude against um, floats by some of the political people. And I think that was unfortunate because I think we do need music. And I think that, I think there's been an um, evolution of an appreciation of music in the parade. We've had some years where there's been a lot more music than other years, and um, I really love it now. <laughs> I really have a new appreciation for the mm -hmm. floats that bring us the joy of music. <laughs> Who was the singer? Uh, Sylvester. Remember? Sylvester. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, ben has a question. Well, yeah. I, I just want, uh, this is a question for any of the panelists. Uh, since um, you are early organizer of the parade, um, or the Gay Freedom Day parades. What do you think about the um, the Pride parades for decades afterwards? And um, what do you think should the modern day Gay Pride parade accomplish? Inclusion. Well, I'm probably going to be the deviant person here because I have to admit that I hardly even go to the parade anymore. Um, I. You know, I prefer to go to the lesbian Sarah Dyke March. You know, the Dyke March. Mm. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I did go last year and went to the celebration. We always try to make a little bit of it, but the sense that I have is that there is a lot of you know. Uh, number one, I feel that there's a, a tremendous number of straight people out that. My sense is it's almost 50-50 now. Now I have nothing against straight people at all. No. Who are watching or marching? Who are just part of the whole thing. I don't know about marching, uh, but you know, uh, but who who are part of the celebration. There's just this huge number of people who are out there, and in many ways they identify it as this is me, and that's wonderful. I mean, I think that's terrific, but it may be them, but it isn't me. So, you know, uh, and also a, tr a lot of drinking. You know, all the margaritas and the martinis and and um, it's just a sort of um, I guess I'm just being a fussy old lady but I really you know the, the kind of commodification you know for example I tried to watch the L word 
And you know, to me, the L word must be in Los Angeles because it doesn't, you know, <laughs> it doesn't mean lesbian to me. And um, you know, the kind of I've been, I watch the Gay Channel every now and then, and like everyone else, I love the fact that young people have this sense of entitlement that they can feel that they can be loving to each other, and that they might, you know, that they can get married, or at least that they should be able to. You know, all of this. That certainly was never there when I was coming out as a, as a young woman. But at the same time, I see so much sort of consumption identity that, you know, you're not gay because you love men or because you love women um, or because, you know, you're a free person and you're gay because you have a certain bunch of records or you wear a bias and, <laughs> and, and it's not just gay. And it isn't just gay. I mean, this is true of many, many groups. And, you know, so I would just say that I think that the parade, um, it, maybe I'm not seeing it the way, you know, a, a really in-person would, but it seems to me that it's not much fun anymore. It's sort of um, same old, same old. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have that democratic quality that I love, that everybody is coming together to invent something. It seems more like it's very established, institutionalized, um, it, it costs a lot of money for anyone to get into it, um, and, you know, therefore, it doesn't interest me that much anymore. I mean, it might, okay. you know, there could be a change. Well, after we invented it, it was invented. <laughs> well, we invented a lot of things <laughs> that, that just changed, and they... <laughs> <laughs> when you invent something, you have to kind of let it go because right. it's going to do whatever. Well, then, it wants. but then, and then somebody yeah. else might figure out a way to make money off of the invention. Oh. But I'm well, tired absolutely. of the commodification, <laughs> but it's part of our society. Absolutely. In all yeah. directions. In any, in every way. And I, yeah. the, every year, I would set up a booth and then take it down when all the trash is all over the ground and <laughs> at the end, and uh, uh, to get people's attention with now a few thousand booths, it seems like. Uh, you have to do some hawking, and it's kind of tiring, and I, and sometimes the volunteers disappear when it's time to clean up. So uh, every year I say, this is the last time I'm doing this. <laughs> and every year, uh, <laughs> but this year I'm not going to be doing it. There's a bunch of young, try to work people doing it. Well, I've already spoken for the early activists, which is they would have never even imagined. They. They they never they thought they just thought uh, where they were in the '60s is was great and that's probably where it was going to stay. So what's been achieved in their lifetime? Looking at Phyllis Adele getting married, whether or not you agree with marriage as an institution, to me is a moot point. Looking at them getting married in San Francisco is like my grandmother who was born in 1898 remembering the first motor cars, the first radios, the first televisions, manned flight to the moon. Uh, it's beyond human comprehension how fast and how much happened. Uh, that was sort of what was iterated to me over and over again, that they just, and they felt like it was really out of their control. That it was nothing that they had really imagined. It wasn't. They had organized. They had planned. They had strived. They had dreamed. But it was something much bigger and greater than any of them could have ever known. And they were just part of being many one of many catalysts. And just because you launch the ship doesn't mean you know where it's going to go. Or yeah, you're, you're not even like really. You're not even really. You may just be like letting go of the ropes on the wharf. Right. Uh, yeah. So the other thing I was going to say, just for me, mm -hmm. being younger, a younger generation coming and inheriting all this stuff. Is Hank, I remember my very first parade. I went with a group of people from my college, and when we saw a members of our college contingent, we just hopped on in, and we and we marched because we was. I felt I was overwhelmed. I was so yeah. excited, and it was so fun. You could. It was very porous. Mm -hmm. There weren't yes. the monitors yes. 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 who said, "Here's the crowd. Here's the well, parade." The barricades. The barricades ruined it. The so many even, Everywhere. Yes. I mean, it was like there's now a separation. The only other thing I do have to say is uh, then I got very involved, like all of us, and I ended up at one point doing all variety of things around the parade to the point where I was paraded out and 
you know, you're in those booths and you're asking people, shall I dispense your pride in 12 ounces or 16 ounces? That's well said. And are you feeling liberated yet enough? Yeah. So I, I need uh, your coupon. Yeah, so you get a dollar off on liberation if you right. give it the door. So I, But that raise mon raises money, money yeah. for charity. Like what I wanted to say, though, is that it's easy if you've been at it for a long time to feel saturated and at a place like that you get super saturated and you start to take it for granted and I have to remember my first pride parade and I have to remember I grew up in Hollister which is 100 miles south of San Francisco and I was born in 1964 and I was a teenager in the 70s and there was an explosion happening here and it might as well have been happening on the other side of the country as far as Hollister was concerned. So I think sometimes we forget that it's like an oxygen tank. It's a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a touchstone. Mm -hmm. And when you live it all the time, you can sometimes say, oh, people don't need it anymore, or I'm over it, or it's not enough. And I think that um, it's never enough. Bring it on. More of it. Bigger, better. <laughs> because that's kind of what it is. It's, it's messy, it's big, it's oversized, it's kind of always out of control. But that's because it's, there's so many people that want to get stuffed in. And I'd rather, as you said, I'd rather include than exclude. Right. I always see right? Even if I have to get a little bit over-organized and institutionalized, them. I'd rather yeah. have yeah. more, yeah. more yeah. faces, more difference, more people and, of all kinds and my, than my, less. Yeah, my attitude towards the parade at this point is that I, I don't miss it. I go every year. And it seems as if it's a lot the same every year. And I, I think it's a really good thing. I sometimes think there's a little bit too much of it. But it's a really good thing. And it's not my position to say there's too much of it. Um, However, it is my position as moderator to say that it's 8.05. Mm -hmm. And like the parade, we perhaps have had too much of a good thing. There's too much to fit in. Oh. So um, I want to, uh, to thank all the panelists and thank everyone who came here. And uh, thank anyone who might be watching the tape at some point in the future. And thank the History Society, which Thanks. needs your support. Thank you.